It's Sunday morning, and we are <clears throat> we are in a study. I've changed my message. I've been teaching on prophecy uh, on Sunday morning. Been teaching on the seventy weeks of Daniel, and why we're close to the end of time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night, I taught on predestination. I haven't taught a series on that in a long time. I insert predestination in every message. But as far as predestination itself, I haven't just spent some time just on the sovereignty of God. So Mary made the statement. She said, you need to go back to, uh, my wife don't tell me what to do, but I'd been thinking the same thing. I need to go back to doing some predestination on Sunday morning. Predestination is the most resented and hated doctrine that is Bible truth by the world today. It is true. You cannot deny the doctrine of predestination. Predestination has a meaning and it is absolutely necessary that we preach it to the believer. It is a comfort to the believer. It has a meaning. The word predestinate is the word prohorizo. When the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, there in Romans 8 and 29, this is the word predestinate. You can take the word predestinate and throw it out the window. That's not the word. It is the word prohorizo in the Greek text. It comes from the Greek word pro and the word horizo. This little mark that I put here, that's called a diacritical mark. It has a breathing sound, an H sound. There are no H's in the Greek language. No H's, but there's a diacritical mark. When you see that, it's ho rizzo. It means to bound, bound. And pro ho rizzo means to before. Pro is our prefix pre. It means before bound for the people that God foreknew. It does not say for what God foreknew. Did God know what? Yes. Why did he know what? He ordained everything. God has declared, Isaiah 46 and 10, he's declared the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, everything that's not yet done if we're right here, <coughs> everything that's not yet done, he's declared, and he says, I will do <coughs> all my pleasure. <coughs> I'll do everything I want to do. <coughs> that includes all the evil in the world. I did a paper. I've got it up here. Got it right here. And the title of it, Does God Create Evil? He says, I will not pity. And I go through this, and I took the word of evil all through the Old Testament, where God says, I will bring evil upon Israel. I will bring evil. Uh, in Second Kings 6.33, where uh, there's a great famine in the land, and there's an evil in, in Israel because they've been going after these idol gods the scripture says behold this evil is from the Lord over there in Job the first chapter uh, Satan comes before the Lord and the Lord says to Satan have you considered my servant Job how that he's the richest man of the east and he escheweth evil he's a righteous man and Satan says to the Lord Turn him over to me, and I'll make him curse you. God says, he's in your hand. Now, here's your instructions. Satan is nothing but the hand of God. He does the will of God. God says, all right, now, here's your limitations. You can't touch his body, right? Satan says, yes, sir. And you cannot touch his life, okay? And so Satan begins to move upon Job's life. The Bible speaks of the Sabians coming in and stealing all of his cattle and his camels. And then the Bible says, the amazing thing it says, 
is the fire of God fell from heaven. It doesn't say the fire of Satan. The fire of God fell from heaven and consumed the rest of his cattle. And while this man was speaking, telling Job all these things are happening, his seven sons and three daughters are in a house. And the, the Bible says that the winds came and blew the house down and killed his seven sons and three daughters. Then Job says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, you have to understand you've got to define words. Name is the word Shem. He said, Blessed be the authority that kill my sons and daughters. I'll curse the day I was born. Though God slay me, I will trust him. And when he said these words, he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord hath given and the Lord hath taken away. He didn't give Satan any credit for anything. And I love the last verse of the first chapter of Job because the last verse ascribes to God what he did. The Bible says in the last verse, in all this Job sinned not with his lips nor charged God foolishly. The Bible says... When Job talks about me, he tells the truth. I killed his kids. I took all of his substance. Well, in the next chapter, the second chapter, Job is still praising God, and Satan goes back before the Lord and says, let me touch his body, he will curse you. God says, okay, now here's my instructions to you. Satan is the servant of God. People say, how can we grow in truth. Well, we have to go through sufferings, through fire and trials. Think it not strange concerning this fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. It's not a strange thing when we go through fire. Fire and trials is what, is what it takes. It's a prescribed of God that we go through these things to hone us into the likeness of Jesus. That's what Romans 8 and 29 is about. For whom he did foreknow, the people, the whom's he foreknew, whom, whose is the word. That's an H sound, whose. In its masculine gender, singular. There's a people that God foreknew, not what he foreknew. Did he know what? Yes, he did. The reason he knows what is going to happen is because he ordained everything. He's declared the end from the beginning. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. What are his works? We have obtained an inheritance, Ephesians 1, 11. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counts of his own will. Does that just mean good things? That means everything. That means the evil in our lives. The evil that comes in our lives is the good that's in our lives. It is for our good. There's an absolute necessity to preach predestination. The main reason is because it's true. And the second reason is because it is a comfort. It is a comfort to know that everything that we are going through is the will of God. Don't care if you have a heart attack. I've had a heart attack, had heart surgery. I've had cancer surgery. I've had... I've been in the hospital with all kinds of health problems in my 40s until I begin to bow to God and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. That's what it takes to break us. No one will come to God without predestination. No one. Because men don't know the wickedness of their hearts. So whom he did foreknow, foreknow, prognosco, P-R-O-G-I-N-O-S-K-O. Foreknow doesn't mean he knew about us. Doesn't say for whom he knew for for whom he foreknew about. <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> doesn't say that. <coughs> we get the word prognosis. A prognosis, you go to the doctor and he does tests on you, then he does a prognosis. The only thing is there's no such thing as a doctor doing a prognosis because he does not know beforehand. He just does these tests, and he guesses. He does a professional guessing. So what it is, it's a prog guesses. The doctor doesn't exactly know. They 
take a guess, and if that don't work, they'll change the carburetor the next time or give you a tune-up. <coughs> Try one. <coughs> For whom <coughs> he foreknew. Pro gnosko. Gnosko means to have an intimate relationship with. Remember the men that are going to stand before God in <coughs> Matthew 7? They'll say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name and thy name cast out devils? <coughs> and thy name done many wonderful works. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, Depart from ye that work iniquity. I never gnosko you. You are never mine. <coughs> Excuse me. The ones that I foreknew, I have predestined. Prohorizo. <coughs> Predetermined. I have before bound. And this word horizo is our word horizon. It means to predetermine for the light. <coughs> Y'all, excuse me, please. <coughs> Guy wrote me one time, said, you need to stop that coughing while you're preaching. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't feel bad. I'm just trying to get this stuff <coughs> loose. It's been in my lungs. <coughs> All right, I'll quit. I think that's funny. I got chronic bronchial asthma, and he's telling me, stop that. If that'll work, I'll do it. All right. <laughs> Prohorizo, to prehorizon. There is so much in the word predestinate. When you show the horizon, you show the horizon. The horizon is where the light shines, isn't it? Light shines. It's a boundary of light. The light is shining down here upon the earth, and the opposite of horizon is darkness. It's darkness. Now, when you look at the word forgiveness, forgiveness is the Greek word, is the Greek word aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S. -E Here's the word <laughs> forgiveness. This is what pre-horizing us encompasses. This is the word forgiveness. Aphesis. This word forgiveness means to pardon and release from prison. Now the word prison in the Greek text is the word Fulake, P-H-U-L-A-K-E. It means the division of day and night or light and darkness. Therefore, forgiveness has to do with bringing us from darkness to light, but forgiveness is not merely a simple thing. Whenever you are forgiven, there has to be repentance. <coughs> <coughs> and you cannot repent on your own. No one can repent. What in the world does repent mean? Repentance, metanoia. means to be <coughs> turned and think differently. The only reason you will repent is because God reveals to you the darkness of your heart and how wicked your heart actually is. No one will repent who thinks they're a good guy. If you think you're a good guy, you're not. When left alone to yourself, no one will come into the kingdom. No one can come in. The Bible says so. 
So you have to have repentance. I give a definition of repentance that most people don't understand. You have contextual definitions just like you have, have word definitions. The best definition for repentance is over here in Jeremiah 31. Let's look at Jeremiah 31. You can't turn yourself. The only reason you will want to think differently is because God opens up your heart and shows you the darkness of your heart and what a wicked, godless sinner you are. And then you'll begin to cry out to God when he shines the light in your heart, births you. If you do not feel shame for your past, there's something wrong with you as a believer. I am so ashamed of the things that I have done when I was young. I was a gospel singer. I was a pop singer. I've sang in clubs all over America. I've sang in concerts all over America. I am ashamed of the way I have lived. Without shame, there's no repentance. Unless you are embarrassed at the darkness of your heart. I've had people call me and say, well, I'm too evil and too wicked to come to your church. We've got some of the most wicked people's past here. Dave used to travel with heavy metal people. We got a guy who used to ride with the Hell's Angels. You haven't done worse than they've done. You hadn't done worse than I've done. But you have to recognize that in your heart. God has to open your heart and show you your wickedness. Look here in Jeremiah 31. This is one of the best definitions, and it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. That word goodness in the second chapter of Romans is the word crestato, C-H-R-E-S-T-A-T-O-S. Crestatos means to meet a need. You need, if you belong to God, He's got to open your heart and show you how just how wicked you are. If you think you're a good guy, you're not. Nobody here is good. There is none good, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Nobody seeks God. How are you going to get into the kingdom if all you've got is you're dead in your sin and all you have is a dark heart? Can you bring yourself alive? You have to be birthed by the will of God. We're born. Speaking of the new birth, John 1, 13. We are born not of blood. It actually is the word bloods. It, it's plural. What does that mean? Well, they have found out, the doctors used to think the blood came only from the father. They found out it comes from the mother and the father in the last 60 to 70 years. So it's not by your parents that you're born again, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your flesh cannot will you into the kingdom when you're dead in sin. If you think a dead man can will himself alive, then next time you go to a funeral, just go over there to the, uh, I've said it before, just uh, after your friend has been dead for two days, go in there with a hamburger in a sack and some french fries and say, come on, sit up here and eat this. You hadn't eaten in two days. See if it could bring itself alive. You can't bring yourself alive when you're dead. You're wicked. You're godless. You've got a godless heart. That's what I was bringing out here a couple of weeks ago. Look here at this Look here at this Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah. This is what Jeremiah says. Verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim, which is northern Israel, they were carried away into captivity, bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me. I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. The yoke of the kingdom was the laws of a kingdom. And northern Israel had not kept the laws of God, so God chastised them and carried them away into captivity. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. Only if God turns me will I be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. You can't repent until God turns your mind and says you have been wicked and godless. And after that, I was instructed. After you begin to repent, you'll begin to listen to the instruction of God. 
I smote upon my thigh. That means to take an oath to God. After you, are, after you repent, you'll start listening to the instruction of the Scripture and you'll be hungry for truth. I was ashamed. If you have no shame, you're not repentant. I, my father was a very hard man. I've heard him say so many times, I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done, and I'm ashamed of the things that he did. He'd pull guns on people, get two befores after people. <coughs> <coughs> he would curse them. Even confounded. The word confounded means humiliated. If you're not humiliated at your sin, because I did bear the reproach of my youth, you will take the blame and say it was my fault and you'll stop pointing a finger at other people and say they did this to me. You'll say it's my fault. My sin is me. The problem with us is our own sin. God has to lead us to repentance through fire and trials, opening our hearts. That's what predestination is about. It's about God dealing with us. For whom he did foreknow. Everyone always wants to quote the first part of that verse, and they don't want to get to the end of it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did the people that he foreknew. He predestined to something. Predestination is not just about you get to go to heaven when you die, no matter what you do. God picks his people before the foundation of the world. He had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 and 4. He's chosen us, but he didn't just choose us to go to heaven. He chose us to, this is Ephesians 1 and 4, to be holy and without blame, Before him in love. Now you got to define love, you got to define without blame, and you got to define holy. That's what we were chosen to. Holy, hagios. Without blame, amamos. Love, agape. Now, he's chosen you to these three things. Without to be holy, first of all, hagios means to be pure, single. You see, we've got two men in us, according to Romans 7. We've got an outer man that serves the flesh, and we have an inner man that's been born in us, and that's Christ in you, or that's the kingdom of God that's in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the inner man says to the outer man, you have to die daily. I want to put you through so much fire, so much trial, so much tears, brokenheartedness, your heart has to be broken over your sin. David said, a broken and a contrite heart thou will not despise. God has to break our hearts and make us say, oh, woe is me, I'm a sinner, I'm undone. He has to cause us to do that because we will not do that. There's none that seeks after God. Before you are born again, you have no inner man. There's nothing to convict a man's heart. He is dead. People say, well, what do you mean dead? Well, I mean dead. He can't do anything right. That's what the Scripture says. We went through a lot of those verses. Let me give you this. Amamos comes from mamos. It means to blame. Amamos means without blame. The alpha negates the word. means no blame. How are we not going to be blamed? The inner man is perfect. The outer man 
is imperfect. The outer man is the flesh. It takes God a lot of years to work on that outer man and cause him to be willing to take his cross and die daily, to admit his sin and look at himself and say, I am a worthless sinner. If you've never said that to yourself, that's something you have to say. It's very difficult for proud men in the flesh to look at their own hearts and say, I am so ashamed of the way I've lived. You have to have shame for the past. Now, God's not going to hold that against us. He'll remove, our, he'll remove our sins as far as the east is from the west, but we can't forget the shame that we brought upon Christ. Now, Hag Hagios. Hagios has some derivatives to it. That's the word holy. You have the word hagiadzo. Then you have the word hagiasmos, H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. Now this word hagiadzo is the word sanctify. Sanctify doesn't mean to stand up here and look sanctified. I am sanctified. I am. No, no. It is something God does to us. It's also the word hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. When we say hallowed be thy name, we're saying make your, your onoma holy in my life. That's the word name. Onoma means authority. God's authority is his word. That's his word. That's the Holy Spirit. That word is truth. The spirit is truth. That's the word of God. <coughs> Hagiasmas is the word holiness. Now, how do we become holy when we got this outer man? How do we become sanctified? Well, the scripture says in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, he scourges every son he receives that we might be partaker of his holiness. It takes the scourge. What in the world is a scourge? It's a, God used the Roman flagellum when he had the writer of Hebrews write that. It, the word scourge there in Hebrews 12 is the word mastigao, M-A-S-T-I-G-O-O. -O. That is the verb form of the noun mastix. The mastix was the Roman flagellum that had pieces of glass and bone. And God says, I will beat my children mercifully to get rid of that outer man. And it might take me 25 or 30 years to get your attention. Boy, I have been rebellious against God. Has anybody been rebellious except me? I know you have. Just raise your hand because you're lying if you don't. That's every one of God's children have lived in rebellion. Has anybody got a beating besides me? <laughs> I know you have. I know you have. We've all been, if you're, if you're 50 years old, you've been beaten, haven't you? It's a bloody whipping. Jesus received the scourge before he went to the cross, and it was this scourge right there. He said, that's what I do to all the children I receive. He scourges every son he receives. We can't receive Christ. He can receive us. That word receive there in Hebrews 12 is the word dekomai. It comes from the word dek, which is the word ten. A decade is ten years. Decade. And decalogue is the Ten Commandments. Dek logos. Decalogue. And dekomai means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. God says, I have to accept you. You can't accept me. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive, receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. You cannot accept Christ. You cannot accept anything spiritual. The Baptists preach that, and that is one of the biggest lies that's ever come down the road. That word dekomai, the natural man receiveth not. 
that word receiveth in 1 Corinthians 2.14 is the same word as he, as he scourges every son he receives. God can accept you, but you cannot accept him when you're dead. The natural, sukikos, P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S. It's our word physical. It means the sensual man, the man that can feel, touch, see, smell. That man does not accept anything spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says so. You can't accept Christ. He has to accept us. And if he accepts you, he beats you to get sin out of that outer man. And that's the truth. Now, we're predestined to be conformed. So, and we're chosen to be holy. He has to beat us. Had to put us through misery. All kinds of trial and persecution till we get fed up with ourselves. The last time the Lord did a real big number on me was in the hospital in my mid-40s when I thought I was dying in Hendersonville Hospital and I sat up on the side of the bed. I've given this testimony so many times. I looked out at New Shackle Island Road and said, Lord, if I don't stop doing what I'm doing, trying to be rich in real estate, trying to be somebody important, you're going to kill me. God, I am so sorry. And I started taking the blame. I quit blaming the brokers. I quit blaming the promoters in music. I started blaming me. You have to come to a place where you say, the only reason, let me explain something to you. The only reason you get in trouble with the world is you're out there running around with the world. You're out there trying to climb their ladder. They don't care about your, your principles and your morals. They don't care about that. They want you to leave them alone, get off of our ladder. You can't go into the music world or the real estate world and start telling them what to do. They're going to be crooked. They're going to live in gray areas. That's what they do. <coughs> Why are you getting in trouble? You're out there running with the wrong crowd. You're, you're a sparrow trying to fly with buzzards. You can't fly with buzzards. We're supposed to fly with our own kind. And I'm talking about sparrows. I'm talking about, about the meek the lowly, the brokenhearted, the bruised. That's who we need to be running with. I do not run around with bankers and lawyers. I preach to them. I go down here to the bank, preach to the banker. You say, boy, you sure do know a lot about a lot of things. Well, so I've been reading since I was a little boy. That's all it takes. I'll talk to my doctor and tell him, I like my doctors. I like them as men but they don't know nothing about God or the Bible. And I, I told my cardiologist, I said, he had a Bible on his desk. What for? I don't know. I reached out and put my finger on it and said, you don't know nothing about this book. You're ignorant. He starts laughing because I'm telling a brilliant cardiologist, you're an ignoramus. I told him, I said, you're an ignoramus of this book. And he is. He, he'll talk to me about the heart and he's brilliant. And then all of a sudden he'll switch to the Bible and it's like, that's what it sounds like. It's like, you're an idiot. They don't know, they know their field and that's it. Now, so he's chosen us to be holy with a scourge, without blame. That's the inner man. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. What do you mean? I didn't say that, First John. 3 and 9 says that. But what's born of God in you? Is it this flesh? No. It's the inner man. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, which is Christ, remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Oh, but 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So it's that man that can't quit sinning that God's got to work on for years with this scourge. And the scourge comes in the form of bankruptcy, divorce, losing. You mean God ordains divorce? Well, yes, he does. There's nothing he doesn't ordain. I make peace and greed evil. <coughs> I, the Lord, do all these things. <coughs> There's nothing he doesn't do. 
Satan is not a co-god. Satan is the servant of God. The only people he can take to hell with him is the ones that God wants him to take. They're called vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And the vessels of wrath, Romans 9, 22, that are fitted to destruction, they cannot become sheep. Goats are goats, sheep are sheep. That's it. Everybody out here in the world is either a goat or a sheep. And you cannot turn a goat into a sheep. Goats don't need a shepherd. I've got, a, got an old uh, <coughs> calendar, <coughs> calendar we had several years ago. <coughs> it shows these goats. They climb trees. They're standing on top of trees. No shepherd let them up there. The ibex goat over in, in uh, Europe, the ibex goat climbs... They climb, look up Ibex on the internet. They climb a dam that's just about at that angle. And it's got little bitty tiny footholds going to a little rock. They got little bitty baby goats climbing up that. And they don't need a shepherd. They can climb up there and eat that, that moss or that salt. It's unbelievable. Goats are not sheep. Sheep have to have a shepherd, and they can't do that. They can't do what the Ibex does. Goats are goats. They were born goats. They were bred to be goats. They're vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, fitted, catortizo. And that is the majority of the world. The scripture says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find the straight and the narrow way. Narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. That is the verb. The noun is T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. Thalipsis. And that is the common Greek word every time you find the word tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. The tribulation will be in the form of this scourge. It'll be our enemies coming against us. They'll hate us for telling them about predestination. They'll hate us for telling them that Christmas is pagan. They'll hate us for telling us, telling them that you have to have a daily cross. Without a daily cross, you can't go to heaven. You can't go to heaven when you die without a daily cross. Not possible. Why? Because that's your opinion? No, because Jesus said so. Luke 14, 27. He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. I told a teller in the bank that one time. I said, that's a hard word, isn't it? She said, yes. I said, you can't go to heaven without a daily cross. I said, do you know what a daily cross is? And she just did this. Shook her head no. I said, then you don't know where to get one, do you? And she just went, No. I've asked that question to many people. Did you know without a cross, a daily cross, you can't go to heaven one day? What is a cross? You had to be condemned to a cross in the first century. You couldn't be condemned if you're a Roman citizen. You could only be condemned if you're a slave or a criminal. Jesus was crucified as a criminal. And you have to... The world has to look at you like you are totally out of your mind when you say predestination is true and God does not love everybody and Christmas is pagan. Whether you like it or not, Christmas is Christ's mass. It's Roman Catholicism. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Now, it's either the same thing, but you cannot change sin. And God has predestined us. He's elected us and called us to be holy through this scourge, to all these trials, through this fire, and he's going to get rid of that outer man. When you get old, when you get old, we got a fellow here named Milton. He's 95. Milton's just about got rid of all of his sin. God's just about got rid of all of it. When you're 95, you're going to have a little thin veneer of sin left. You will never get completely get away from it. Most of that's gone. All that 
strife and turmoil and all the desire for the flesh is gone, just about gone in Milton. You sit down with him and talk to him. He'll, tears will come in his eyes and say, I want to go home. It's very touching to talk to somebody like that. So we've been chosen to be holy without blame with that inner man as he kills off this fleshly man there when Paul said, when I do the things that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, the things that I do. He said, I don't want to do. That's that outer man. So God has to work on this outer man. This is what we're predestined to. And to, to be holy and without blame before God in agape. This is what we're chosen to, is to walk in agape. What in the world is agape? You ask some church of Christ, we have an agape program here, and they don't have any idea what it means. Agape I start to tell people agape, and they'll always say, oh, that's a God they love. You don't have any idea what it means. Agape. You have a verb form, agapeo, A-G-A-P-E-O. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens as scourges. If he loves you, he's going to chasten and scourge you. I wear a shirt. I got a couple of shirts, about three shirts, that says God does not love everybody. And I wear them out in public just about every day. I'm over there at the Sam's Club the other day. Some young girl walked up to me trying to give me a Seventh-day Adventist pamphlet, and I said, I don't believe in that. Started talking to her. There's some old guy about mid-70s, somebody maybe about my age, walked up and said, well, who does it God doesn't love? And I just turned and I said, he hates all workers of iniquity, Psalms 5 and 5. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. Well, my God loves everybody. I said, maybe yours does, but mine doesn't. I don't even try to argue with him. I say, I'm sure yours does, but yours is not the God of the Bible. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. So when you see the word loved, you got two words for love. And I put this on the board more than anything else that I put on the board. There's nothing I put on the board like this. If you don't know what the word love is, you're just up a creek. You got two words, phileo and agape. And both of these words have been translated into the word love. Sometimes you have the word charity. Every time you find the word charity, it is agape. Every time you find it, then in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Well, whenever the Bible says God is love, love your neighbor, love your enemy, it is never this word right there. It's never phileo. Now, that's the word we always think of as love. To like, have affection, or to be desirous of something. I like cake. I like God. I like my dog. <laughs> I like drugs. I like to get drunk. You can like anything. In fact, this has many derivatives of it. You have the word philia or philos, which is the word friend, friend. And that is never the word, love your neighbor, love your enemy, God is love, never. It's always this word right here, agape. Or it's the verb form, A-G-A-P-E-O. That's what we're supposed to be walking in but walking in agape, we're chosen to be holy and without blame before him in agape. Agape was a relationship that kings had for their subjects, that fathers had for their families. They gave them laws, and they willingly walked in them. 
the best definition of agape that you can find in the world in any book is in the Bible. 2 John 6. Here's the best definition of agape. 2 John 6. This is love. Well, let's just put the word that it is. This is agape. This is agape. Or agape equals. Equals. This is agape that we walk after his commandments. And people, boy, they would hate that definition. We're not saved by works. We are saved by God working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. If he's not working in you, getting rid of that outer man, you don't belong to God. Somewhere in your life you have to have shame. You got to take the blame. You got to realize what a sinner you are. You really have to realize how dark your heart is. Job the 15th chapter tells us, All men drink iniquity like water. Does that include you? Yes. Does that include me? Yes. We're not talking about the new man in us. This outer man guzzles iniquity. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, you, each one of you can take that to heart. Your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above everything. And until God births himself into you, you're worthless. If we don't come to that realization of how wicked our hearts are, does anybody know how wicked their heart is? I was a real good boy as I was growing up. I was the best kid you could find. I never cussed. <laughs> Didn't talk about the little girls out there on the, on the playground like the other boys did. Wouldn't use any dirty words. Never used those words. I had to grow up, get into the music, get into gospel music to find out how wicked my heart was. I began to look for fame and fortune and I was proud and lifted up and I began to fall into sin. But I was the best kid you could ever find. When Daddy would whip, Clyde would beat me up and he was my older brother and then Daddy would come in and whip both of us. And I never thought that was fair. He's beating me up and throwing me around the room. Daddy come in and spank both of us. I was the best kid. I had to grow up, get off into the music world to learn to cuss. You mean you did that? Oh, yes. To get mad and get angry all the time. You ever been that way? God has to reveal to you the wickedness of your heart. And I'm not going to tell you about the sin I've been in. Some things were very illegal. God has to deal with us to make us realize who we are. So we have to be, he has chosen us, eklegomai. Lego is the verb form of logos. It's a systematic discourse. It's written down in a book or a discourse. It's here. He has chosen us by this book to be holy and without blame, walking in the commandments of God. When you think about the commandments, who do you think they're for? What are the commandments of God? Thou shalt not kill, yeah. Thou shalt not steal, yeah. Thou shalt not covet, yes. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, yeah, that's part of it. Every time you have what's called an imperative mood in the Greek, an imperative, let me erase some of this, I can't. An imperative mood. Let me write this down. Every imperative mood is a command that's written in your heart. You may not have to memorize all of them. No, if it's written in your heart, you'll know what it is. Does anybody know when they're doing wrong? Or do you ever have a shaded feeling of saying, I wonder if this is wrong? If you wonder if it's wrong, it's wrong. 
<laughs> That's where we have to learn to come to. If you wonder if it's wrong, it's wrong. We need to abstain from appearances of evil, not just evil. At 78, I, I'm not the person I was at 30 and 35. I had a lot of sin in my life, and I was a young preacher back then. And I wanted to be somebody. You have to come to a place where you know you're nobody and that you're worth nothing. What's amazing to me, all the people I aspired to be like when I was young, they're dead. Everybody I looked up to is dead. Oh, what good are they doing me now? None. An imperative mood. is a command. And if it's written in your heart, you are commanded to do this. If Jesus says, and he was the God in the beginning, if he says, let there be light, is there going to be light? Is he the same God that said? He said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisee said, you're not even 50 years old. You've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am the I am God. And they would, will kill you for making yourself equal to God. You blasphemy. And he moved away from him. <coughs> I'm saying this for a point. If he is the I am God. By the way, the word Jehovah means self-existent. Jehovah. means self-existent. And when you am, am is the form of the verb to be, which means to exist. All those being verbs I always give you, be as am or was, were being, been, have, as, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, make, my, must, can, could. That's all the being verbs. Am is a form of the verb to be or to exist. When Jesus said, I am, I exist on my own power then he's the I am God in the beginning when all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He's the one that said, let there be light. Did the light say, well, I don't know if I want to be. Give me an invitation, him, just as I am. And I'll see if I want to be. When he gives the command, it is so. And when he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Every time he says that, here, akuo, is a command. It's an imperative mood. And hoop, akuo, is the word obey. It means where you hear. It means to hear under hoopo. To hear under or to be subordinate to he is telling us, you must hear this. This is no choice on your part. This is not your choice. I gave you an ear to hear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. You will hear me. Do you hear me? You say, I don't want to. And he says, I'll beat you <coughs> with all, <coughs> all these stripes. <coughs> and one day you'll give up, and I know exactly when, I have got the straw that will break your back as a camel. And he puts it on top of you and he crushes you one day. And you go, okay, God, I surrender now. It might be 25 or 30 years. But he has preordained that we'll walk after his commandments. So when he says, hear this, every time the New Testament says that, it's a command. He's saying, obey me. He's not asking you and I to obey. He's commanding us. Do you wrestle with anything about whether you're doing right or not or saying the right thing? Say a little cuss word once in a while and you feel bad about it. Well, stop that. If you don't, God will drop a hammer on your head or an advent on your head. We have to clean our lives up and walk in His commandments. How about strive? Agonizomai, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. We're still talking about 
walking in his commandments. I, I remember my father would read, strive to enter into the straight gate. And I thought that meant try to enter in. It's not the word try. You're not trying to enter in. Strive. Agonizomai. It's an imperative command. It's our word, A-G-O-N-I-Z-E. Agonize. The agon was the arena at Rome. They went in there. They were fed to the lions. They were put in there with the gladiators. And here's what the Lord is saying. I'm not asking you if you want to agonize. I'm telling you, you're in the arena. This was the agon. That Colosseum was the agon. And the Christians were fed to the lions. He says, get in the arena and agonizo my agon. Get in agony. And have the world pointing a finger at you, crucifying you. And they'll turn the gladiators in on you and they'll turn the lions on you. And that's our command to get in there and agonize. You say, Jim, I, I have problems with my family. They don't like this predestination. They don't like Christmas as pagan. That's going to be their problem with God, not you. <coughs> don't try to convert them. Tell them the truth. If they don't hear it, leave them alone. God's people have been chosen already. And all we need to learn to do is do what he says. Oh, how about humble yourself under the hand of God? T-A-P-E-I-N-O-O. -O. It means to level mountains and hills. Anything that raises itself up to God, it means to level self. And Babylon is the mother of all idolatry, and she was founded on self. Let us make us a name. Let us make up our own doctrine, our own onoma, our own shem. The shem is the Old Testament word. Onoma is the New Testament word. And Babylon was a proud mountain. And God says, I'm going to make you a destroying mountain, and I'm going to cut you down and make you a burnt mountain. And the mountain of God is Zion, and we're supposed to be following that. Instead of this, let us make us a name, and we've got to level this mountain of self. Say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. That's another whole story. We are chosen to, be, to walk in God's commandments. There are about 1,900 imperative moods in the Greek. Now, they don't all apply to Jesus. Some of them apply to the Pharisees. When the Pharisees are given a command, it doesn't come to pass. When Jesus gives a command, humble yourself under the hand of God. <coughs> the amazing thing is what is the hand of God? David said in Psalm 17, Deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword and thy hand. God raises up wicked men to cut us down, to get rid of self. Evil is commanded by God. That's why the scripture says, And we know that all things work together for good. All things work together for good to them that love God. That's the word agapao, agape. Those that are walking in the commandments of God, everything's working together for your good, your heart attack, your sickness, your wife leaving you, your, your kids being sick, losing your job, losing your house, your car being repossessed, your house being foreclosed on. It's all for our good. That just don't seem good to me. Well, the things that I went through in 1967... 68, 69, 70, 71 didn't seem good to me at the time. It's one of the most wonderful things that's happened in my life because it caused me to be who I am today. Thank God for his hand of mercy when he crushes us, when he humbles us by his hand. When we humble under the hand of God, he'll do the exalting in due time. 
We want to raise ourselves up with our fleshly man out here. We're predict we're chosen to be holy, walking in the commandments of God. There's so many of these imperative moods. Jim, I can't remember them all. You don't have to remember them all. They're written in your heart. You know when you're agonizing over something you're not supposed to be doing, don't you? I know. Do you know? It's not hard. You just say, should I be doing that? Should I be saying that? Should I be living in that gray area with these people on my job? Should I be stealing? Should I be lying? Should I be embellishing things? Should I do this? No. Let your yea be yea and your nay nay. No beating around the bush. Paul said, seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Plainness. Here's how we'd approach people. Parhesia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. Great is the word polis. Great. Polis. It means much. Plainness. Blunt. To the point. Do not beat around the bush. Do not circumvent going around a situation. Don't circumvent a situation. So I'm going to ask you a question. People ask me questions all the time, and I say, no. Should I do this? I say, no, absolutely not. Somebody will call and say, I'm trying to get my girlfriend to listen to this message, and she just won't listen. I said, are you living with her? Well, yeah. What do you expect her to listen for? You're living in your sin. I get right to the point, and I'm not doing it to be mean, I just suspect they're living with a girlfriend. I've asked many people that. I say, you need to either marry her or separate from her. There's no need. Do you know that when you beat around the bush, you finally got to face the truth anyway? Have you ever learned that? Yep. So why not face it right now? Don't, don't try to hedge on people. And Well, uh, you see, uh, I, uh, I really didn't do that, and I really didn't mean that. What I meant was, that's double talk is what it is. Now, so we've kind of not exhausted agape, without blame, holy. These, I can teach on these words for 10 years. Just take one of them and teach from now on. But I got to get to the rest of the scripture. We're predestined to conform. The people God foreknew Without predestination, nobody's going to live right. Nobody's going to live holy and without blame. Without predestination. I got so many more of these imperative moods. Forbear one another. An echo. That's a command. But you'll know that. It means to put up with little things. Put up with little idiosyncrasies from one another. Now, the people that God foreknew... You can't do any of this because there's none righteous, none, and nobody seeks God. You don't have any good in you. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. The best thing you can come up with is nothing. Vanity is the word hebo. It means worthless. The most upright thing you can do is absolutely nothing. The scripture tells us if men of high degree, if men of low degree, scripture tells us over in Psalm 62 and 9, men of low degree are vanity. Low degree are vanity, 62.9. This is why you can't do anything to make yourself right. You cannot make yourself alive. If you ever come alive, it has to be by the will of God. The scripture says in John 5, 21, Jesus quickens whom he will. Quickens, Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O. Make zoo. Make alive. You go to zoo see living animals. He makes alive whom he wills. 
You don't make yourself alive. It's the Spirit that quickeneth and makes people alive, not your will. We, of His own will, begat He us. When He says of His own will, He used the word boule. Purpose. When He says, when the Scripture says in John 1, 13, we were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, <coughs> nor the will of man, but of God. That word is the word thelema. In John 1, 13, the word will. It means determination. God determines who his children will be by adopting them into his family. The word adoption is an amazing word. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. That's Ephesians 1, 5. He's predestined that we will be adopted. That word adoption, I love that word because it tells you how you get into the family of God. Adoption. Huyo. H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. This is the word adoption. It comes from the word huyos and tithome. Tithome means to place. Huyas is the word sons. He places sons according to the good pleasure of his will. He picks out one, says, this is my son, I'm going to birth him. He crosses your path with the preaching of the truth, and he places you in the family of God, and you become a son, and that's just the beginning. When you're placed as a son, you're not left alone. You don't just birth a son and say, okay, son, change your own diaper, and the milk is in the refrigerator, go in there and heat you up some milk. You got to take care of children. You have to feed them. You have to spank them. You have to make them grow up. You have to make them go to the doctor and get shots and, and whatever else they need. Healthy food. God says, you're just a baby. He speaks of little faith. Little faith. And faith has to grow. Oligos. Puny faith. Besides all this, give all diligence. Add to your faith. Second Peter 1 and 5. And he names seven things you have to add. The first thing is maturity. How long does it take you to grow up? A long time. Have to get rid of that old outer man. And God will do that with fire and trials and persecution and divorce and cars. And losing your car, losing your house, losing your wife. You're losing everything. One day you get on your face and say, Oh, God, forgive me for what I have done and how I have lived. Now, back to this verse over here. Psalm 62 and 9. Men of low degree. Are vanity. Who are men of low degree? Are Hebo, a lie are worthless. Men of low degree, that would be truck drivers, somebody works down here at the supermarket, somebody that works in the street, and a guy that's on construction, that would be low degree. The next sentence says, men of high degree are a lie. Doctors, lawyers, bankers, now they can grab at this if they want to. High degree, do you know everybody's putting on a front? Has anybody figured that out besides me? <coughs> they, they come out looking respectable. Hi, hello, Mr. Brown, and how are you? What can I do for you today? You don't hear them cussing at home, getting mad at their wife, slamming doors, ranting and raving, and a whole lot of them do. If they don't have Christ in them, most of them do that to some degree. And if they don't yell real loud, they get mad inside and do little tricky things. The whole world is full of evil and wickedness. If a man doesn't have an inner man in him and he's not birthed and God's not working on him, what is he? He's worthless. He's a lie. I don't look up to doctors or lawyers or bankers. I just don't look up to them. I treat them decent. I'll tell them the truth. If God wants to deal with them, that's his business. If he don't, that's his business. 
Everybody out there has already been chosen to be either elect, predestinated of God, or vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Their natural brute beasts, there in 2 Peter 1 and 12, 2 and 12, their natural brute beast. And they are made, made to be taken and destroyed. The word made is the word genia, means born. They were born to go to hell, and that's most of the world. You can quit getting angry at the world because most everybody in the world are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. The Bible says so. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's give good pleasure to give the kingdom to the little flock, to the few. Few will, when he said, strive to enter into the straight gate, agonize entering in, for many I send you will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. The reason they're not able is because they're trying to enter in the wrong way. Even the word enter, enter ye in, enter, E-I-S-E-R-C-H-O-M-A-I. I circle my, I circle my, is a command. It's an imperative mood. He's not asking us to enter. He says, enter in at the straight gate. Straight. Stenos. Means to crowd through a narrow opening where everybody is pressuring you on all sides. That doesn't sound like the Baptist message, does it? Just walk down the aisle and accept Christ and you're home free. <laughs> no, you're not. You're home free because God's going to take you all the way home. He that hath begun a good work in you, Philippians 1 and 6, he will perform it all the way to the day of Jesus Christ. <coughs> he said, of all that the Father has given me, I should lose nothing. I'm not going to lose one of my sheep. They're mine. They were mine before the foundation of the world. John 6, 44, no man can come to me. I like to just stop right there. No man can come to me except my Father which has sent me draw him. That word draw, helco, means to drag in. When Peter was fishing in John 21 and he threw out the net and he dragged in the fish, he dragged in the fish. That's the same word, helco. Unless God reaches out and pulls a people in, nobody's coming to him. Predestination is an absolute truth. It is absolute. It has to be preached because what it does, it encourages the flock to know that everything that's happening to you is for your good. And we know that all things work together for good. To agathos is the word good. It means benefit. Agathos. Everything works together for good to them that love God. They're walking in the commandments of God because God insists He put it in their hearts. And to them who are thee called according to His purpose. Called is the word kaleo. Kosia is the word church. And it comes from ek and kaleo. We are the called out of God, called out of this world to live holy and without blame before him in love. As we walk in the commandments of God. I used to think that people talking about walking in the commandments and keeping the commandments of God were being legalistic. Well, we are. It is God's legality that he writes in our hearts and says, you have to live this way. I used to think, well, everybody got a little sin and they can't help it. Well, you're going to help it if God keeps dealing with you. My wife is 74. I'm 78. We live this quiet, peaceful life, and we didn't used to do that in our 40s. God will deal with your heart and with your life well, you'll say, I want to live a quiet and peaceful life as much as is possible, like Paul told Timothy. 
We want to live righteously and godly and holy. And those words, you, when I say righteously, I don't mean self-righteously. When I say righteous, I mean dikaya osune. Righteous comes from the word decay. This is not hard to understand. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. That's the word righteous. It is a form of decay, which means right. Do you know what's right? That's not hard to even figure out. When you start questioning things in your mind, say, Lord, help me not to do that until you show me something more clear in my mind. How much time do I have, Mike? 18? All right. Now, people want to ask questions about God. Let me just read a couple of those verses that I was talking about, about you can't make yourself alive, you can't make yourself right, you can't seek God. Proverbs 20 and 9, who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Not one. You can't clean yourself up. Job 14 and 4. Excuse me. Job 14 and 4 says, Who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Proverbs 20 and 9. Who can say I have made myself clean by my decisions? You can't. In Matthew 19 and 17, Jesus tells the rich young ruler, There is none good when he says, Good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus said there's only one good, and that's God. There's only one agathos. There's only one that's beneficial. That's God. If I'm good, I'm God. Over in Ecclesiastes 7 and 20, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, not one. Romans 3, 10 through 12, there's none good. There's none that understandeth, and no one seeks God. If God doesn't seek himself a family, no one is coming. If he doesn't birth people by his will, nobody's going to be born again. We were born. You must be born again. The word again is the word anoth. And when, he, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, it means from above. Your birth has to come from God, not your fleshly will. You can't will yourself into the kingdom. How's a man born again? How's a man saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe is the verb form of faith. Faith is the word pistis. P-I-S-T-E-U-O is the word believe. <laughs> believe is a verb. A verb is something you do. If you believe something, you do it. Every time you add 2 plus 2, if you've got good sense, you're going to get 4. You're not going to get 22. And that's the way the world thinks. Well, I want more money than my bank account, so I'll put 22 down. Well, I'm sorry, but that don't work. People want to redefine God's Word. You have to go with what it means. It means what it says. I've had people say, I read Romans 9, where God loved Jacob and hated Esau, Forever came to grace and truth. And I didn't know what it means. I said it meant what it said, and it said what it meant. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either were born, for either one had done any good or evil. And people will say, well, God knew how evil Esau was. Nobody was more evil than Jacob. He was a liar, a deceiver, a crook, stole from Laban, his father-in-law, lied to his father, said, I am your son Esau. Stealing a birthright. God had to, the fact that God would love Jacob, God loved Jacob, that word love is agape. Who did God give his commandments to in the Old Testament? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He gave his commandments to Israel, to Jacob. That's why he said, Jacob, have I loved? I gave him my commandments. Jacob had to be a self-confessed sinner. And so do you and I. The difference between us and the world, most of the world, most of the Baptists I was raised around, they didn't believe that they were that bad. 
People don't believe they're that bad. God has to reveal to your heart how wicked your heart is. And then you will say, I've got to change the way I think. But it won't be you that does it. It'll be God working in you to willing to do of his good pleasure when he realizes, he makes you realize how wicked your heart is. Real nice people don't want to repent. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You have to be a self-confessed, bona fide, 100 percent dark-hearted sinner in order to want to change your mind and god has to reveal that to you <coughs> he only reveals it to his elect and we are predestined to be conformed here's what we're predestined to and you can't do this because there's nothing good in you until you realize i have owned up to my sin and realized the sin of my past is some of the worst things that could ever happen to a man. Now, everybody else has the same thing. It's just whether you've admitted it or not. And if you ever admit it, it'll be God that causes you to own up to it. Man's very nature is pride. His very nature is to defend his flesh. And you can put blame everywhere you want to and God says, the blame is yours. The only reason you're in trouble out there in the world is you have the wrong associations. The Bible says, come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. We have to separate from the world. When you get out there running with the world, trying to climb their ladder, well, they built the ladder. It's their ball game, their ballpark, and their ball. Don't expect to go over there to some company or run with a family member and expect them to like what you're saying they're not what do i do have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness but rebuke them and then pull away from them and have nothing to do with them if anyone comes bringing any other doctrine any other didache instruction romans 16 17 if they preach any other doctrine that's contrary to the doctrine that you've learned, avoid these people. Oh, by the way, avoid, actually no. Is an imperative command. Lean away from, lean away from. Go out of your way to stay out of their way. Because they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple. Watch out for smooth talk. That's all I hear from the preachers. I listen to preachers on the radio. They are idiots. What do you mean idiots? Idiotes. Unlearned. They know nothing about the Word of God. I don't ever hear a preacher oh once in a while somebody will kind of hedge on predestination and they'll hedge on this and they'll hedge on Christmas but they won't go full force into it and say that it's evil that God's doing everything he wants to do we're predestined to be <coughs> conformed if we're predestined to be conformed whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image to the icon likeness it's our word icon it's our word ICON ICON we say what's an icon of rock and roll music first thing people say is Elvis Presley what's an icon of the presidency John Kennedy uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower Franklin D. Roosevelt those are icons they represent it means to represent or be like like to be like we're predestined predetermined for the light our forgiveness is predestined because we are predetermined to be rebuked by God it will take effect in our hearts and we will come out of darkness to light and he says now that you're in the light don't wander back to the darkness but we do and he says I'm going to take the next 30 40 years to whip you real good and you're going to submit to me if you don't spank your children, the Bible says you hate them. God scourges all of his children. 
we have to, what do we do with our children? Train them up in the way they should go. What does that mean? Take them to Sunday school? No. Lord, train up <coughs> Newark. Means to narrow them. The word narrow it then the <laughs> in the New Testament that's not Newark, that's rest. Connock. To narrow them, the narrow in the New Testament is the word T H L I P S I S. It means tribulation. Learn them to teach them to be in the tribulation way by standing for truth, by talking truth to people. Teach them in home, teach them where they lie down, where they rise up. Teach your children the truth so that when they go out in public, they'll talk to other children. We've got kids here that witness to people. This little girl right here witnesses in school. She's giving away DVDs in school. She says her friends don't like her anymore because she tells them that Christmas is pagan and God doesn't love everybody. That's narrowing our children. We're predestined to be like Jesus. Now, in order to understand his likeness, we're going to have to, what we're going to have to do is read all of the Bible and find out what he was like. Compassionate, sympathetic, but all those are conditional words. Sympathy is a Greek word, sympathos. Pathos means to suffer. A pathologist is a doctor of suffering diseases. Sum means with. It means to suffer with them. They have to be suffering for Christ in order for us to be, have sympathy to them. You can't have sympathy to somebody. You don't go down here on Dickerson Road to the Starlight Club on Saturday night and go in there and start dancing with some woman and say, there, there, it's going to be all right. She don't need sympathy. She needs rebuke, doesn't she? And you don't need to be on the dance floor anyway. We need to separate from that. You don't have sympathy for somebody who's living rebellious towards God. You only have sympathy for those who are suffering for Christ. Some pathos. We are predestined. And if God doesn't call a people to him, man can't come to God. Over there and look at Job 25. Job 25. This is actually what you are. Job 25. Do I have any time? I'm about, about out. Verse 4. How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? You can't be clean. You're not clean. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in God's sight. That's because Satan, when he was cast into this great sphere called our universe, he corrupted everything. <coughs> between, <coughs> between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. <coughs> How much less man that is a worm. <coughs> Word worm is rima, R-I-M-M-A-H. Maggot. That's what man is. <coughs> He's just a maggot. <coughs> if you ever realize what a sinner you are, I'm going to come back next week and talk about people arguing with God over him doing all these things. He said over there in Romans 9, 21, Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You think you have a right to talk back to God when you're nothing? 
people think that actually people in America think they're good people. I'm good people. I'm a good person. You know why most people think that? God has never put them into a situation with great temptation and then withdrew his restraining hand from them and said, go do your dirty deeds. If God ever does that to you as a believer, you'll wake up one day and say, oh, wretched man that I am. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I'm a wretch. No one here has committed the sin of the apostle Paul. Nobody. Paul was a murderer of Christians. Probably killed hundreds of them. Murdered them. He said, I made havoc of the church. I murdered them. No one here has done what David did. I'm quite sure nobody here has. He had a very faithful servant named Uriah the Hittite. He looked out of his palace one day and saw Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, on a housetop naked and said, I want her. He got her over there to the palace, got her pregnant, <coughs> and then said, oh, goodness, what am I going to do? Her husband is up there in the battle fighting the Ammonites. I'm going to have to do something. So he called Uriah home out of the battle. He told Uriah, go home and sleep with your wife tonight. Maybe you won't notice Maybe the people won't notice that the red hair and freckles is mine. See, most people, most of the theologians believe David may have had red hair and freckles because he was ruddy-faced, red-faced. And Uriah, that night, David got up the next morning and Uriah was asleep on the palace steps. David's going, oh goodness, what am I going to do? You didn't go home and sleep with your wife? No. So he gives Uriah a note. He says, take this to my nephew, Joab. He's the commander-in-chief ahead of the battle up there. Take this note to him. He gets to Joab, and Joab opens it up. It says, put Uriah in the heat of battle and withdraw from him so he'll be killed. David committed murder. Has anybody done that to one of your most faithful friends? Uriah was the friend of David. He said, I can't go home to my wife while my king is in battle. If you haven't done what David's done, the psalmist, but David repented when Nathan rebuked him, said, Thou art the man. And David said, I only have sinned. It wasn't Bathsheba. It was just me. David knew Bathsheba. Her grandfather was David's chief counselor. His name was Ahithophel. At some time, Bathsheba had to have come in there and says, Is my grandfather here? David was a sinner just like you and me. And we would do the same thing if God put us in that kind of temptation and withdrew his restraining hand from us. We'll do the dirtiest deeds. If God doesn't call himself a people, no one's coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. <coughs> Continue to crush us under your hand. Lord, I've been such a sinner. Forgive me. I pray you'll touch the hearts of these people. Saying, I'm a soul ashamed of my past. I'm ashamed of things that I do. Help me to live right and righteously and godly. <laughs> Lead us to your elect family, and you are fighting our battles, Lord, and you are supplying our need. We ask all this in Christ's name, amen. <laughs>
I guess, yeah. Let me get a drink of water first. Where are you going? Do you love me? I love you. You want some gum? Huh? Yes, please. You want gum? Yeah. Well, that's my cough drop. Get uh, get over here. Zach, I was going to call you yesterday. I just didn't feel good. I was going to call you, but I wasn't feeling good. I'm still, I'm still battling this stuff. Oh, I can, I can tell a little bit. Yeah. How you feeling though? Any, any, any better? Any better from I'm Wednesday? I'm taking, not real. Here, 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 here. Where's those other kids? Take some to sisters. Take some to sisters here. <laughs> here. Here you go. Take these to your sisters, okay? 